So let's bring in Hollywood divorce attorney David Glass for more on this. David, people going through divorces are going through some of the hardest times of their lives, and a lot of what they're going through is emotional. And in any divorce, there's a huge sense of loss, and the loss of relationship, of money, some friends. We're back for another episode of the Hourglass Podcast, where family law and psychology intersect. I'm David Glass, a certified family law specialist, former psychologist, and the author of Moving On, Redesigning Your Emotional, Financial, and Social Life After Divorce. Today, we continue with our mission to do all we can to make the holidays easier for those who are suffering from a recent breakup. Mental health is today's topic. We'll cover rehab, suicide prevention, and treatment for suicide loss survivors. We will also offer some discussion on red flags, Signals that someone you know might be vulnerable in considering suicide as a remedy to their woes. In that segment, we'll also have a discussion on teen suicide. I first want to say to you, don't feel badly if you feel badly about the holidays. More and more studies reveal that this time of year is the hardest one for all of our recently divorced couples or those going through a breakup. The same holds true for a couple's kids and for a couple's extended family members. They're often caught in the middle not only for the first holiday season after a breakup, but for years after. In my 25 years of family law, I've yet to see a client who has not had a brush with some sort of mental health issue during the divorce process. Like dealing with death, divorce disturbs the mind's equilibrium and status quo. For some people, it's transitory. For others, it can go on for years. We have some excellent and highly trained experts on the show today to face, head-on, different states of mental health that typically occur during and shortly after a breakup. I tell all of my clients, and I'm telling you, dealing with a mental health issue is nothing to be fearful about or ashamed of. So let's get to it. Marissa Garcia El Pidama, LPD, PsyD, MBA, is a licensed clinical psychologist with the Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation the nation's leading nonprofit addiction treatment and mental health care organization. She's going to talk about addiction treatment, when someone needs it, when someone sabotages it, and how to reach out for help, whether it's for yourself or someone you know. Based in Los Angeles, she has been a therapist for more than 11 years, treating patients from age 10 to 110. Now set us straight, Marissa. I understand the term rehab is no longer appropriate. So how should we refer to what your center and others like it call it? Treatment center is what Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation is kind of using at the moment and it kind of works because people don't get uh, sidetracked and know that treatment includes mental health actually as well as substance use. Okay thanks for clearing that up. Um, Now walk us through the signs that will let our viewers or someone he or she knows uh, indicate that they need to check into an addiction treatment center. When social functioning is actually not as with they are supposed to be. An example would be they're forgetting things that they're responsible for, mm-hmm. not showing up for appointments, being late for school, or actually not showing up for work is a common thing. And also the way they treat individuals at home. And if you are a loved one, it's important that for the patient, the identified patient, that you are considered a concerned significant other to be able to spot that Because we have programs right now in Hazel and Betty Ford that we actually train the significant other to help bring in the Mm. substance-using person that does not realize that they actually need help or they refuse to actually go in. Right, and the the importance of those significant others and family members and social connections. Uh, I'm thinking back 35 years, I did my dissertation on people being forced into addiction treatment versus people who went in, quote, voluntarily. And what my research found was that the voluntary people actually had all sorts of coercive pressures to bring them in, whether it was from family or for social, uh, social contacts or from their employers. And so you're, at Betty Ford, your focus on these significant others seems to be right on point. Yeah, we have this program that we just launched. It's called CRAF. Community Reinforcement and Family Therapy Program, where we focus on the significant others, the CSOs, and make sure the patient, identified patient, will be able to get the treatment they need, preventing a lot of, because you're into family, David, so a lot of family dysfunction 
interactions, and especially during the holidays, like you mentioned, this is something that is sometimes family could be positive, but yeah. family could also be triggering. Sure. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, whether a person wants to go in. So does someone have to agree to go into an addiction program uh, voluntarily? That's a good question because you know the laws in California, there are involuntary ways and there are legal uh, situations. Mm -hmm. But for sure, we would always want them to have their signed consent and permission to go in because it's not a rehab, it's not called rehab anymore, so it's not a prison. So you're there, right. you're free to go and choose to go as right. you please. But of course, it's on your own responsibility. Right. Now, how, do, uh, how does one start the process of entering addiction treatment center? Uh, what are the steps? Good question. It's very simple. All you need is a phone call. Mm -hmm. And with Hazel and Betty Ford, we have our website set up, hazelandbettyford.org. Look at the admissions number there and call us. If you are thinking of other options nationwide, it's also findtreatment.gov. And you can also look at your options too if you want to go in another state or things of that nature. And after the phone call, our admission specialist would actually walk you through and do a confidential assessment. Okay. Decide if it's mental health assessment mm -hmm. or substance use assessment. And then from there on, they take note if what level of care. So I think you're very familiar with that, David, residential sure. or outpatient. Right. And from then on, the intake specialist will schedule you after off, obviously signing the necessary consent and permission of the patient. And also, we do a lot of research on collateral information, which I think you do that as well in your job. Right, so right. talking to, you know, to the family, to a healthcare professional. So we have a full picture of what this patient needs. And when they do come in, if it's residential, we have an intake specialist walking through the paperwork and touring the whole facility. Now, if it's outpatient, we have them come in, also do the paperwork with our intake specialist, mm -hmm. but they have a program set because it's outpatient, and then they will just follow through the program. If it's in person, we do also virtual now, which is a right. thing that happened during the pandemic, and sure. we're very thankful about that because now we have gotten reach to a lot of people. And in my area, the other area is mental health. I reach patients all the way from Northern California, and I'm in here in LA, all the way to the whole part of you know so SoCal. So it's very much enriching. I mean, outreaching now rather. Right now, is there a is there a certain season when more people come in for addiction treatment, uh, and is that season the holiday season? It is now, right? Right. <laughs> so the holiday season really triggers a lot of people because of the pressure, stress, and sometimes. People's situation are not in cog is, uh, There's a dissonance on the way their life is and what we expect to happen on the holidays. Right. Also, for substance use, it's actually sometimes it's the holiday of celebrating. So they are used to celebrating with substances. So relearning not to do that and not celebrating is definitely a you know a trigger. Yeah. Also, and you know this, David, on the practical side practical side of things, the deductible insurance, most people have met it by the end of the year. Right. So two months down, they actually look at it like as it makes economic sense to go to rehab or right. to the treatment center in our case. And then when they go there, um, if they have flexible spending accounts, they get to spend it down and they feel very much ready for the next year. So right. that's why the there's that also need to actually come in and do it to the last two months. Sure. And so... Uh, if uh, if someone goes into residential treatment, what's the typical length of a stay? That's also a good question because usually uh, people ask that up front. It depends on what the person needs mm -hmm. and how thorough the services are. So, an example, when it's substance use and they don't need the mental health uh, options and things like that, then it's probably shorter, but when they're done, we don't tell them you're done. Right. There's right. recovery. Yeah. So this treatment is just a start. So sure. you keep on figuring that out. And is there any sort of figure on the average length of treatment uh, if you're doing outpatient treatment for some sort of addiction disorder? Or is it a, a lifetime participation? Well, it varies. And I have patients that I have taken from substance use and just with me with mental health. It could vary for like 
six sessions, they know they're stable and just come back monthly. Or it could also be that, oh, you're really very raw and things have been triggering for you. So twice a week, I will be seeing you. So outpatient happens to be on, on different different planes, especially if they have the mental health piece there. Yeah. Sure. And now, so what can someone expect will be involved in the addiction treatment process? Uh, tell us a little bit about the various types of therapy and things that are used. We're proud in Hazel and Betty Ford that we actually have all professionals from all levels. So there's individual therapy, group therapy. There's also focus groups. I do one like dialectical behavioral therapy every Wednesday weekly, focus mm-hmm. on that. And then psychoeducation, medications, because we have psychiatrists on board, mm-hmm. and also supporting them with their AA or any 12-step program that they want, or not the 12-step program, like smart recovery and, right. and things like that. Sure. Um, now, looking ahead to the, the actual holidays and mm-hmm. the celebrations you mentioned, are there any tips for someone who is uh, in addiction treatment um, that they can use to so that they don't fall back into destructive habits? I think it's important to do what we call radical self-care. So radical self-care is taking care of yourself inside and out. So your diet, your sleep, exercise, including Uh, using all the professionals that are there for you, if it's outpatient mental health, or you have a psychiatrist, regularly see your psychiatrist. So all of that, including the the AA and support groups, is a whole programming. Also going into meditation, we teach them that too and open them to that option as well. And all other self-cares, like they want to practice activities rather, yeah. Right, so it's it's encouraging them to do other things that are, I guess, more positive than falling back into their old habits, if if I'm paraphrasing correctly. Yes, and I almost forgot food, of course. The diet is important because it actually affects your mental health, whatever you put in your body. Got it. Now, are the the majority of those who enter an addiction program, um, is it because of drug or alcohol use, or is it, are there other reasons that they enter? So, interesting enough, they come there because they're overwhelmed. And when you look at it that way, it could be all different situations, Mm -hmm. but we have found that we have a lot of people with dual diagnosis issues, meaning mental health and substance use. So they come in there because they needed help and get relief. And they found out there's a lot of things that they didn't expect to get in the treatment, but it actually helps them. Sure. Now we recently learned of uh, actor Matthew Perry's uh, many failed attempts at addiction treatment or relapses. Um, is that an unusual case, or is there a high relapse rate for people who are in treatment for addiction? I like you put in the word relapse there, David, because treatment is actually a, a journey of discovery, and which leads to recovery. And so in his case, he is not succeeding at certain times. It's actually part of the whole thing, for you to learn and build up your resilience in, in your recovery process. And so as long as a person has the internal motivation to, to try and follow whatever strategies and methodologies we have available, there is no reason they wouldn't succeed eventually. So I applaud him for actually being open with the whole situation. Sure, sure. And, it, and it seems to me the, the willingness to get up and try again it seems to be the key part of his story and how he got to being successfully sober. I agree with that, for sure. Um, is there anything that people would be surprised to learn about addiction treatment that they didn't know? I think one of the things about us, Hazel and Betty Ford, we've been around for 73 years, right. is this was established because people in recovery felt that healthcare wasn't focusing on them. Yeah. And so we, for us, we focus on the whole aspects of addiction and healthcare and all, which means your family, we have programs for kids, we have wellness, we have individual populations targeted in different industries. Mm-hmm. So it's an encompassing kind of approach to dealing with, with the whole situation. So it's not addiction. Addiction is not drugs. It's actually the people, as our CEO, Dr. Lee, would say. So we want to focus on the people. Right. Right. 
Okay, and um, how are the programs at uh, Hazelden Betty Ford any different from other type centers? And in addition to what I already mentioned, uh, we have all professionals from different walks of life. So we have dietitians on board, we have psychiatrists, psychologists such as myself, licensed counselors, uh, peer group support, and we have staff that are really trained uh, from our admission specialists to even, we even assign you a financial advocate to help you maneuver right. to the insurance process and make sure that you're covered because we are practically vetted for all insurance companies. Sure. And we are JCO accredited, which mm -hmm. is, that means we're accredited to really be the, the best that you can find in the industry, you know. Sure. Is there anything uh, else you want our viewers and listeners to know uh, before we sign off? I like just want to thank you, David, for the opportunity to be here. And your message the same as ours, which is to help a lot of people. You help people in different ways. And this one aspect, I'm sure you dealt with your clients. And hopefully we can have a good partnership with you, with your clients, and we can be there for them to help them. Because we're a nonprofit organization. And we truly want to get this message out. Absolutely. Thanks, Marissa. That was very informative. Uh, let's hope that those who need it will reach out for help, get well, uh, and move forward to a better way of life. Next on our show today is Noreen Vanderhoven, who's the founder and owner of Westlake Trauma and Resilience. She's a licensed clinical social worker with over 35 years of experience working with adolescents, adults, and families. She's also certified in EMDR therapy. That's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Noreen speaks frequently on the topics of suicide risk, compassion fatigue, and secondary trauma. Her main area of focus these days is seeing suicide loss survivors. Most of her clients suffer from complex trauma. Impressive credentials, Noreen. You're just the expert we need today. Thank you. Uh, we really do want to talk mostly about how to deal with um, people who have uh, suffered uh, from a loss due to suicide. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about EMDR in a little bit. Great. But first, um, how do people who suffered a loss, they have a family member or a friend uh, who died by suicide, mm -hmm. how do they come to grips with it? Well, I, I don't know that you ever really come to grips with it. I know right. like with grief, grief is never over and it changes through time. And I mm -hmm. think it's really being able to get the support um, one of the ways is through uh, different groups that they have throughout the country, through the United States. And so I think the more that people have that support, whether it be from an individual or from a group, I think that that really helps their process. Sure. And what kind of stages do people go through uh, after, a, after a loss of a family member or friend? Interesting. So years ago, they thought there were all these stages that, they had a process, there really aren't any stages. So if you imagine like a ball of yarn all tangled up mm -hmm. and grief is like pulling that yarn through and there's not really, and so it comes untangled until yeah. the end, right? Yeah. So it goes through anger to denial, to depression, back to anger, to acceptance, to it goes all three different stages through over time. It, it kind of never ends, but it just, like I said, changes. Gotcha. So if, uh, if someone has suffered the loss of a loved one from suicide, what are some of the coping mechanisms they can put into play to help them deal with it? Um, I think that, like I said, getting support is a big one, but I think if you were by yourself and you need to have something to help, mindfulness is a really uh, helpful way to do that. And um, I think it's being able to slow yourself down and just be in the present and not be able to think about the past or not be able to think right. about, you know, five seconds into the future. And so just being able to stay present is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's the, probably one of the biggest ways um, that people could help. And there are all different types of mindfulness tools. Um, yeah. Meditation isn't for everybody. So, so there's different ways of, of being mindful other than the, traditional meditation, sitting in the lotus position. Yes, even exercise is, you know, mm -hmm. mindful, whether it be walking or running, whatever it is, but it's, you're really paying attention to that moment. Drawing in those little, you know, the kind of coloring mandalas. Yeah. That you have to really pay attention and focus on drawing inside the lines, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. mindful. 
Okay. So it's anything like that. Or like I said, the ultimate is really getting that support um, and having someone to call at, you know, any time. And they do have those resources, which is awesome. I can, I'll provide them for you. And Excellent. Yeah. And so um, often, is it, is it common for people uh, to feel that maybe they should have done something or maybe, maybe they could have intervened? Does that sort of, do those sorts of guilty feelings uh, intrude on a lot of people? Absolutely. I think the people um, closest to them, and sometimes even people who maybe have only had one or two contacts with them feel like, oh, I, you know, I should have known or I should have done something. And, you know, one of the big things that I really try and help people with is there's really no should. You know, should is like a judgment on yourself, sure. and, and that puts a lot on somebody. And sometimes you just don't know. Um, that's and really try and help that person, you know, heal themselves and see how that other person, even if they, you know, left a note or even if there were signs, you just never know. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And what um, what about survivor guilt? Is that something different, or is that fold into what we just talked about? I think it's that folding into what we just talked about, and it's just showing yourself, um, helping that person understand, like giving them a lot of self compassion. And just being gentle with themselves, that is really important. Okay, now switching uh, topics slightly. Okay. What is EMDR and what is it used for? It, it's come out since I was in graduate school 35 years ago. Yeah. I'm not practicing <laughs> as a psychologist, so I don't know. I hear a lot about it. Yeah. But break it down for us, please. Um, so the first thing that I'll have to say about it is that I also, I was in graduate school like 35 years ago, right. and I've been doing EMDR for about the last seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. About 90% of my practice has been EMDR. I've seen the most healing in that seven to eight years, and I have in 35 years. Wow. That's incredible. So it's, um, it's never too soon to do EMDR, you mm -hmm. know, I've worked with uh, suicide loss survivors the day after um, someone has died by suicide. So the reason is because it helps before that memory gets into that working memory part of your brain, yeah. you're able to work with it. So if you can imagine like a filing cabinet and there are all these files that are out of place and there are papers messy and you can't shut the filing cabinet drawer. Mm -hmm. What EMDR does is kind of organizes those files and lets you shut the drawer. So those memories are sitting in the fight, flight, freeze, fawn, the amygdala part of your brain. Right. And through what's called bilateral stimulation, so it's using both sides of that brain, it helps to shift that memory. So you're obviously never going to forget this happened yeah. for whatever it is. Like I've mm -hmm. worked with a lot of uh, mass violent shooting victims mm -hmm. and the same thing, but you, that memory is going to be kind of fuzzy in a picture and it's just going to be a memory. It's not going to have any effect on your body because we hold trauma in our body. So that's, that's really how it works. Is right. And so what, is, what does it look like? Is it, is it, am I staring into a machine? Am I just talking <laughs> to you? I, I really have no idea. Sure. So either it's the, um, how it started was a person moving their hands back and forth, their fingers, mm -hmm. and um, the person is just following the fingers, keeping their eyes straight. So that's the using both sides of your brain with your eyes moving back and forth. Um, or through COVID, a lot of people used like an uh, app on a screen watching a ball go back and forth, or else you can just tap mm -hmm. alternatively back and forth. And that's what I use with my clients during COVID. Um, and that's how they can practice also those kind of coping skills resources that we talked yeah, about. Yeah. And the more you tap, like I really saw a lot of healing during COVID because I think like you're tapping into your nervous system, right? These are like mm -hmm. nerves here. So if you do that alternative tapping into your nervous system and you really process that, it helps that healing quicker. And like I said, the, the sooner the better. There's right. never too soon. And I think um, it's with any loss or any trauma or any grief uh, that that happens. And um so I think people always think, oh, no, it's too soon. And you don't really have to talk a lot, which is the wonderful thing right. that, you know, after you do like one set of the fingers, 
we just kind of asked, like, what do you notice? And we asked some other questions. But um, as we continue to do this, they start to notice it starts to become more and more distant. Wow. Um, but I usually just say, just kind of give me one word to let me know what path you're on. And I can yeah. always bring you back to where I need you to be. So it's really people who struggle with some things and don't want to talk about it. It's a wonderful way sure. for them to be able to process that. Yeah. So what actually happens to the nervous system? You've described as a, a, a refiling and being able to shut the door. Yeah. But what happens to the nervous system uh, when someone's brain is unable to process a trauma? Uh, so the nervous system, it really is very somatic, which means, cause like I said, trauma is held in the body. So your body is... It responds very differently. Some people like will tell me their body feels like it's on fire or they're, it's very tingling and different uh, or it's, their chest feels heavy. So the body holds it in different parts. And so right. that's kind of where your nervous system is all flared up. And as you are able to calm it down, you start feeling less and less of that whatever it is, you know, however you feel it in that body. Okay. Um, uh, and so who benefits uh, from EMDR treatment? Could you, could you give us a list of uh, so oh, people are out there <laughs> and they're suffering from whatever. Yeah. What is EMDR most often used for? Um, you know, it's really funny because a lot of people will call and they will say, um, so I have anxiety, but I don't think I've ever had any trauma. I'll go, okay. And then I'll start asking them questions. And, you know, trauma could be as little as maybe like you fell off your bike when you're a kid and then you scrape your knee, you hurt your shoulder, whatever. But your mom's like, okay, just come on, get it back on the bike and get back on it and let's go. Right. Instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Let's try again. Let me help you. Right. 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 So there's two different healing. So that first one is something that you didn't get that care and concern is kind of blowing you off. You're going to hold that in your body, right? right? Small, as big as major car accidents or, you know, divorce, uh, loss of, you know, someone you love, anything. Uh, a lot of people I see uh, have not passed their board exams, whether it be for like whatever or yeah, yeah. You can also use it, interestingly enough, for like sports performance to increase mm. that. It's um, called like peak performance. And so I'll do that a lot as well. So it's really, I have such a variety of clients that it's, it's great. I love doing it. So uh, bringing EMDR specifically to the issue of divorce. Okay. Certainly a divorce is a, in many ways can be a traumatic event for people. Absolutely. Uh, to their egos, to their family systems, their relationships with their children, all those sorts of things. What can you tell our viewers about how EMDR can be used for someone who's going through a divorce or is directly post-divorce? Yeah, so like I said, EMDR is so helpful with any kind of trauma. So the sooner that they could seek treatment, the better because the same thing with the divorce, it's, it doesn't matter because there's so many things. So it goes back to, you know, maybe they've had relationships. One client I have uh, started having really traumatic uh, and abandonment issues with her father when she was three. Yeah. And so being able to heal those relationships as it's gone on, she's had four different uh, relationships, two failed marriages, and when you look at it, it always goes back to that three-year-old. Interesting. And so, yeah, so I think any any stage of anything, it's always different. Um, no two people are the same. Right. But, but I think that that's the way it's helpful is to be able, and then to be able to get yourself to a place where you are able to work from a, a healthier framework and move mm -hmm. forward and have positive relationships, whether it be with yourself or with your children or with another, you know, spouse or partner. Right. So. And, and can EMDR be used, uh, I'm not going to use the right phraseology, but to stave <laughs> off suicide or to prevent suicide in some way? Well, yes, in a sense that I think, you know, I see um, people who have come into me that are very depressed. And so we're able to work with that depression. It's the same thing. It's like finding what they call that touchstone memory, which is that mm -hmm. very, very first time you experience something yeah. 
to cause the chain of the reaction of depression. So I, I liken it to if you think of a volcano and you the volcano's empty, but every time you put these traumas in, right, whatever it is, and it piles up. And mm -hmm. eventually it's just going to blow. Right. But if you could start pulling out these bottom layers, right, it's going to implode. Right. And so that's why it's important. People are like, well, but no, I'm here to deal with the suicide or the divorce mm -hmm. or whatever. And I'm like, right, I understand. But we have to go to the very beginning. Right. And um, so once that starts happening, uh, that's the healing starts. Wow, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Uh, for the viewers and listeners who are watching and listening today, where can they seek help um, just in general? Um, and you know what? The best way to seek help uh, is in your area. I would Google if you're looking for EMDR. Is uh, The site is called emdria, E-M-D-R-I-A dot org. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the umbrella, the parent umbrella to all of the uh licensed or approved sites for EMDR providers. Okay. And so they have a list of those therapists. And for uh, suicide loss survivors, a really great resource is called Speaking of Suicide. So it's speakingofsuicide.com. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of the resources on their page that you can use. And then the Suicide Prevention Resource Center um, is sprc.org. Right. So, yeah. And where do people find you if they want to talk to you a little bit more? <laughs> they find me, uh, they can find me two ways. One is through um, Westlake Trauma and Resilience.com. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, Noreen Vanderhoeven, LCSW.com. Great. Yeah. Valuable information. Thank you. Now I'm at least somewhat up to speed on the MDR, <laughs> but certainly I understand how it can be used. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks it's to wonderful. Thanks for coming in today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Next up, we have two terrific guests, Cheryl Eskin and Tracy Andrews. Cheryl Carp Eskin, LMFT, is the Senior Director of TeenLine, the global leading teen-to-teen -teen peer support line operated by D.D. Hirsch Mental Health Services, as well as the co-chair of the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Network. She began her mental health career as a TeenLine listener at the age of 14 and has worked as a licensed marriage and family therapist for more than 20 years. Tracy Andrews is a licensed clinical social worker with the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. Her role is a mental health clinical supervisor with the Prevention and Outcomes Division, Family and Community Partnership Unit. Tracy is the lead for anti-stigma, suicide prevention, and health neighborhoods. She also currently serves as co-chair for the Los Angeles County Suicide Prevention Network. The two are here to talk to us about a very important topic, one that is difficult to talk about sometimes, suicide. This time of year, as we already know, our feelings are often exaggerated with nostalgia and sadness. And for those trying to recover from a breakup or get through one, the pain is often unbearable. So then, they think about opting out altogether. Tracy and Cheryl are gonna offer us information on how to spot the signs that a person may be considering suicide and how to help them. Let's get right to it, ladies. Uh, here are my questions. What are some of the red flags or signals that you yourself or someone you know is susceptible to suicide? I think the biggest thing we want to look for is a change in behavior, in attitude, in mood, in appearance. Someone who generally is outgoing, who now is isolating, someone who really cared about their appearance, who now is not showering or taking care of themselves. If it's a teenager, someone who cared about grades, who isn't caring anymore, just an abrupt departure in personality, makes us always question what's going on with this person is a time to definitely check in as well. Hopeless and helpless comments, things like, I wish I weren't here anymore. Or right. It just, um, no one would miss me if I were gone. What's the point? What's the purpose? Um, those are definitely all things we want to look for and pay attention to. Sure. Um, is it usually one event that could cause a person to choose suicide or is it a, a building up or a confluence of events that converge all at one time? Yeah, there's no one cause for suicide. And I think for a lot of us, we try to figure out that one piece. It was like, it was that breakup. It was that bad grade. It was yeah. that argument. It was that fight. It's never that simple. It's, it's not one thing. So if you think of in terms of like playing Jenga, when you're playing the game, right? Yeah, yeah. You're taking pieces, but you're making the foundation a little bit unsturdy, right? right. But you're still, you're still intact. 
and then you get to that last piece and it breaks and it all falls. It's not necessarily that last piece, right? It was uh, all of the buildup to that last piece for it to fall. So it's never that simple where one thing is the sole reason for, for um, someone dying by suicide. Right. And, and what are some of the behaviors that indicate a person is suicidal, even if they're not expressing it verbally? I mean, going back to what I said before, just of change in who they used to be, the comments that they might make, isolating a lot more, not planning for the future, potentially giving away possessions or mm -hmm. um, even writing wills. Sometimes we see things like writing or talking or even posting about death um, or right. on social media or to friends and mm -hmm. dropping. We do know a lot of the times it's hard. A lot of times people who do die by suicide or attempt suicide do leave warning signs. We just need to know what to look. We do need to know what to look for. Sure. Um, what kinds of things should you do or say to someone who you think uh, might be going down this road towards suicide? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, there's not a one-size-fits-all statement to say, right? I think for a lot of times we try to find that one right thing to say. Right. There's never the right thing to say. There's just not the wrong thing to say, okay. right? So, like, we want to check in on people. Mm -hmm. One of the things we also have to remember is a relationship with people. It's about communicating all of the time. And so one of the things that we want to ask, like, how are you doing? But we also want to get directly to those questions if we're starting to see significant change in somebody. Sure. So we can start it by saying, if we're more comfortable with saying something like, um, you know, are, are you feeling okay? And a lot of times you'll hear people say, do you want to hurt yourself? That's not the same thing as asking somebody if they want to die. There's a big difference between asking somebody if they want to hurt themselves and if they want to die by suicide. Sure. But if you are more comfortable with starting with, you know, do you want to hurt yourself? Have you been thinking about things? And then you build your way up to ask, actually asking the question, have you been thinking about dying? Have you, have you been thinking about wanting to die? We have to be able to ask those straightforward questions. And sometimes for some of us, it's easier to ask that straightforward question. And sometimes mm -hmm. for some of us, we need to ask a couple of questions before we can get comfortable. Right. The point is, is that we have to be comfortable asking the question um, because the person that we're talking to is going to, is going to pick up on if we're comfortable or not. Sure. And so if we say something like you don't want to die, right? You're not thinking about suicide, right? We've already stopped that conversation from happening. And so we have to just be very mindful of, what mm -hmm. we want to ask, are we able to hear it? Are we prepared for it? And maybe we're not that person to ask. Right. And so also being able to understand in that relationship, you know, am, am I the right person to ask this question? Sure. And at any point, uh, should you start asking, you know, have you considered how you might try to harm yourself? Have you thought yeah. about how you would try to kill yourself? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or do you want to? Definitely. I mean, I think one of the things to remember, whether you're a parent raising a child or just in communication, is the best time to talk about suicide and mental health is when you're not worried about it. So creating that open dialogue early on where your family is an okay place to express emotions and feelings and that you know that um, there are resources for you if you are struggling and how important it is to talk to people when you're struggling. But definitely the takeaway, like Tracy said, is not being afraid to ask the tough questions. Honestly, as a parent, the hardest question you'll ever ask, but if you're sure. able to do so in a calm, not judgmental way, usually people will tell you the truth yeah. and they'll feel so relieved that you see them in their moment of pain sure. and you're right. willing to sit there with them. Yeah. But yes, to answer your earlier question, yeah. if someone says, yes, I'm thinking about it, then we do want to get into assessing what have you thought about doing? Because right. we do know, um, you know, a person who has a more concrete plan or a lethal plan, definitely um, something we need do need to take seriously and work with them. So we do want to get into those questions. Again, staying as calm and not judgmental as possible and not leaving that person alone as well. Right. And then so then what what's the next step? If you get to that point that you don't want to leave them alone, uh, you think there is a danger. What's the next step? Who do you call? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, again, there's not a one size fits all. So I think it kind of depends on your network, your support. Are you already connected to mental health services? Are you connected um, to something where you feel like you can get support, you know, for your mental health? It does what level of support is needed at this time? And so to Cheryl's point, you know, asking, do you have a plan? Is there a method? You know, do you have means? All of these are really important things. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's really important is a safety plan. 
and and just making sure that you you as a family are going through this process and figuring out how can we keep this person safe. And so there's not a one size fits all. It really is. You have to have open communication and you need to be talking about this the whole time. Um, but we also know that mental health services help. But for some people, you know, there, there's a stigma about receiving mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, that's, that's not the avenue that they want to take. And so how else can we explore? What other services might be appropriate for you? Um, what role does clergy or faith base play in your life? What role do, you know, do certain support systems play in your life? And so it's having a conversation to figure out what is that person who is in intense pain? What do they need and how can we help them through this moment? Okay. Yeah. And similar to what Tracy was saying, if there, particularly if there's not a political um, discussion, but if there's guns in the home, guns we know are the most lethal means to die by suicide. So removing um, things that could be harmful from the home with that person in the moment. There also are a lot of resources out there. 988 is what used to be National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They're available 24-7 to talk to you or somebody else who's struggling right. in that moment and can connect you with resources. Teen Line, where I'm from, is a teen to teen resource. So if it's a teen who's struggling, that's six to 10 every night to mm -hmm. talk to someone to get them connected to other help. Right. There's also, I mean, emergency rooms and psychiatric facilities if it feels like this person isn't safe in the moment. But also right. agreeing with Tracy that, you know, figuring out what works for that person in the moment. But taking it seriously is really what we want to think about exploring. Um, also asking questions like, have they attempted before? Because right. that's an important yes. thing to know. A lot of times, um, that's the biggest predictor of someone attempting again, is if they've attempted before. And there's a lot of people who do attempt who don't go on to attempt again or die by suicide. But there's many who do. And, you know, it, they um, didn't get the help they needed. Now this time they're going to try harder, for lack of a better word, sure. and do something sure. that really is harmful. Sure. And I would just add to the, the what Cheryl is saying, that the resources, the, the warm lines are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, Department of Mental Health has a warm line that you can call in and you can talk to a trained listener who can just provide support. They're not a crisis line, but they're a warm line just if you need support. But 988 is fantastic because not only are they a warm line, but they're also a crisis line. Yes. You don't sure. have to be in crisis to reach out to a warm line. Mm -hmm. um, you don't even have to be in crisis to reach out to 988. So there are services that are, that are less invasive and, you know, less yeah. intense yeah. to start off. Um, but there's also texting that's available, 741-741. You know, if you text, you know, help mm -hmm. um, to 741-741, that's a great resource. Um, and so, again, it's figuring out wh what does that person connect to? Would they rather talk to somebody or would they rather text with somebody? And right. sometimes texting is a little less invasive at first, and then maybe they move on to, to talking to someone. Yeah. And sure. that could be the step towards, you know, going into mental health services to actually start talking with a therapist. Yeah. It seems like the... The option of having a warm line, of not having to call in the police and the ambulance and the psychiatric hospital into the situation, that's, that's something that people maybe don't know about and could be using. Yeah, so we have a couple of options that, you know, Cheryl had mentioned. So we have the DMH form line at 1-800-854-7771, and you get to talk to trained listeners. It's a, it's a warm line, so it's not it's not treated as a crisis line, like 988 is a crisis line. Right. However, it is also a warm line. So you have options as far as picking up the phone mm -hmm. and talking to trained professionals that can listen to you and just have a conversation with you. And if calling by phone doesn't work, we also have texting options. You could also text home to 741741. And there, you're not talking to someone on the phone, but you're able to text them. So if that feels more comfortable in that moment, you can do that. Right, right. Now, uh, is there a time of year that suicide is more prevalent? Is it, is it before the holidays, after the holidays, or is it just something you have to look out for? Yeah, I mean, what actually what we see, I mean, it's a lot of people think that holiday that um, suicide spike in the holiday season that actually is generally a myth. Oh. Generally, the holiday season is a time of connectedness and a time of, you know, coming together. Obviously, not everybody has that connectedness and coming together. So people are struggling. It can definitely be a struggle. It also, though, in some ways takes a measure of energy to choose to die by suicide. In the winter months, when everything's kind of Right. slow and calm um, there might not be that uh, it might not be that high a need we usually see suicide spike in the spring 
when the weather starts to change and your internal mood doesn't necessarily match the external environment. So we okay. do see that. Adults, it also could be related to tax time, other times of year. What we do see, interestingly, in teens, psychiatric hospitalizations spike in September generally, which is the back to school time. So, right. um, And that's not necessarily deaths by suicide, but we do see that's a time of year for teens to really be, you know, to really be struggling. So any time of year, we need to keep and track of our loved ones and people in our life and be co- and be concerned. Um, mm-hmm. But um, we usually do see the spike in the spring. Okay. So, and you mentioned teens. So how can you tell when a teen might be at risk uh, of attempting suicide? I've raised two daughters who are now right. you know, off on their own. And I remember they didn't talk to me a lot as teenagers. So <laughs> wait, how do you deal with a teen that you think might be at risk? Yeah, I mean, that's difficult. Obviously, teens can be, by nature of being teens, can be moody and temperamental and self-centered and all those things that, you know, are hard and not always want to talk to their parents. And that was, going back to earlier, just saying, creating that open dialogue in your home that you do talk about mental health, you do talk about things going on in the world and in their peer group and in their friends, and knowing that your home is a safe space for them to come to and to be there with you. Tracy and I were also talking about doing, you know, fun things with your kids Mm -hmm. it doesn't always have to be this like how are you doing check in pressure discussion um car rides are often a great time for conversation because you're not looking at one another or participating in activities that they like to do even if they aren't your preferred activities those can be a great way some of those conversations come up you know come up naturally in that um also i think with teens that unconditional love piece it's hard to be a teen and reminding them you know You as a parent don't always have to like their actions or even them at that very moment, but you do have their back and you are going to be there for them. Um, Keeping in touch with their friends are, teachers, I mean, creating a support village. And if you're not the person they feel comfortable talking to, Mm -hmm. making sure there's someone in their life that they are comfortable, whether it's an aunt or a close family friend, someone of that sort. Sure, sure. All that makes sense. Uh, Are there talking points you can offer in terms of trying to soothe a troubled teen who might be grappling with thoughts of suicide. No, go ahead. I mean, what we hear most, and I have two teens of my own, what we hear most from teens is that parents don't listen. Right. We just want to fix. We want to tell sure. them what to do. Sure. We yeah. want to, oh, don't yeah. feel that way. It's not that big a deal. And when you're a teen, it is a really big deal. Right. And when someone's telling you not to feel that way, I mean, that doesn't work. When someone tells you to relax, do you relax? No. Right, um, right. It just, usually annoys you, maybe that's me. Yeah, yeah. But um, so I think being able to sit and listen and not jumping in so much to fix, just, you know, I'm here for you, I'm with you in this, and even asking them, what do you need from me right now? Right. Do you want right. me to listen to you? Do you want me to give a suggestion? Sometimes if your team will let you hug them, sometimes physical comfort can also be just sure. healing, you know, just healing as well. So um, I know you had stuff to add, so. No, I mean, I, it's along, along the same lines, it's just connecting, mm-hmm. you know, and I think, I th- we talked about it, Cheryl and I talked about it before, like, when you're a new parent and you have this baby, right, and you're so, even if, like, the first child, right, it's like, everything is like, oh my gosh, and you, every step of the way, right, and, you know, that second child comes along, you're like, okay, I got this, I feel better, I feel a little bit better, and we, we tend to think, like, as they get older, we can kind of back off a little bit, and what we're seeing is, like, you know, kids really want us to still be connected, and yeah, so we yeah. have to figure out through that journey of how to stay connected and and making sure that it's a genuine connection and that we also have to kind of change as our t- kid, our teen, our kid is changing. So yeah. we might have loved Disneyland, you know, at age seven, but maybe now we're really into sports. And so making sure that we don't stay as parents kind of stuck sure. in the thing that maybe we felt connected to as they were little, but also finding ways to stay connected as they get older. Yeah. Because it makes it a little bit harder when we start to see our kids slipping away or we see distinct changes in mm-hmm. them. And we want them to just accept that we're asking them a question to give it to us. Right, but right. now they're a little bit guarded. Right. And so now we have to figure out how to connect with them. So it's really important to do certain things. I'm trying, like, this is a totally different world, but like this social media world is different. Yeah. Figuring out the language, figuring out the lingo, maybe watching some TikTok videos with your kids and just figuring out ways to connect so that when you need to have some of those more difficult conversations, yeah. there's connection there sure. because that's genuine. And people know when you care yeah. and when you're yeah. really connected and when it just feels like you're asking just to ask. Right. I think the other thing I just want to keep in mind is like, 
there are cultural differences here too. For some cultures, we don't talk about feelings. We don't right. talk about we don't talk about difficult things. And so when we're looking for red flags, you know, if you were and I brought up in a culture where you didn't talk about those things, maybe you're still not talking about those things. So maybe that wouldn't be a red flag. But really understanding your kid and knowing where the changes are coming are a really important thing. Mm -hmm. And when I say culture, I'm not talking just about race. I, we have family culture. We have friend culture. We yeah, have all yeah. these different components of culture. And even within those different components, it can be different, right? Sure. And so yeah. really getting connected and feeling, figuring out what's going on with your kid and in, in, in that culture is an important thing. Yeah. I also hear a lot from teens, parents minimize how hard it is to be a teen. Sure. Um, yes. Especially, I mean, it's not easy to be an adult and we have a right. lot of responsibilities they don't. And you hear a lot from parents, you know, you think you had it hard. I had to work right. two jobs right. and I had this and I had that. <laughs> your life is not so hard, but it is hard to be a teen. Sure. There's sure. a huge pressure, whether they're college bound or workforce bound, mm -hmm. social media, I yeah. mean, racial justice issues, Roe v. I mean, there's yeah. so much existential yeah. crises to be a teen. So I think recognizing that as a parent, too, that um, as hard as it might be to be you, it's hard to be them as well. I've also heard a great analogy of the teens want a potted plant parent mm -hmm. in the sense that they're just there. They're not really talking or doing <laughs> anything, but right. they know they're there when they can come to yeah, um, yeah. and they need something. Not sure. in their face all the moment, but there when they, you know, there when they need it. Right. Amazing tips from yeah. both of you in, in dealing with, uh, with teens. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want our viewers and listeners to know either about teen suicide uh, or or uh, adult suicide? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot we haven't talked about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think there's a lot we haven't talked yeah. about. So I guess that's an invitation for us to come back, right? We just yeah, invited ourselves sure. back? I, okay, I, okay. <laughs> I never said the teen line number, so I was going to put that in. Teen line is 1-800-852-8336, um, or you can text teen to, um, to 839 eight six three um and that's six to ten every night pacific standard time mm -hmm. i usually say i mean if there's one thing people take away from this conversation is not being afraid to ask or talk about suicide sure. that talking about it does not put the idea in someone's head right. because you also don't ask it out of isolation it's you're noticing things or yeah. you're concerned yeah. or you've seen things that lead you to wonder so if you ask again like tracy said in that calm not judgmental way mm -hmm. they generally will tell you the truth and be so relieved and feel less alone that you've asked so right. not being afraid you're not putting the idea at anyone's head we're just not that susceptible it's not like sure. oh gee i never thought of it before great idea thanks yeah, yeah. i mean that's right. not how yeah. we work so yeah and i would just say um just Keep being curious mm -hmm. as parents. Mm -hmm. uh, stay in that curiosity with your kids. And, you know, Cheryl said earlier, don't get into the, well, I had it harder than you. and than you right, have. Right. That, That's not going to be helpful for anyone. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just, again, connection is everything for adults and for teens. We all were wired for connection. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a really important thing. So if you as a parent feel disconnected, where is your connection and how can you help yourself? Because um, in order to ask some of these difficult questions, we have to be okay too. And sure. so making sure that we're okay and seeing where mm -hmm. we need some support for ourselves so that we can be there for our kids kids if we are seeing some of these things that are concerning even if it's not suicide even if it's just a change mm -hmm. of behavior how can we still be there for our kid or our kids in a way that they need us um and we can only be helpful for our kids and for people in our lives if we're okay right right you know and so we have to really make sure that we're, we're checking in on ourselves too right that oxygen mask first absolutely right, right. And, yeah you know and modeling also to your kids how you take care of yourself and sure. it's hard yeah, it and it's hard it, you absolutely. know we can't sit here and say like oh that's such an easy thing to do yeah. it's hard yeah. right and you and you need people to be able to say Cheryl, are you okay today or you know tracy what what are you wearing you know like right, you right. need to be able to <laughs> check in on people and say like sure. you know are you okay um and that's how we can help take care of each other because it's a tribe. It's not a one system. It's not a one family. Mm -hmm. It's it, it really, this is a conversation that's for everybody. There's suicide touches everybody, whether you've lost somebody, you know, somebody who's attempted suicide. Suicide is, is something that we all need to be able to have a conversation about because it's about mental health. It's about mental wellness. Right. Um, it's not about diagnoses necessarily. It's about mm -hmm. wellness. And so just making sure that we're connected and, and we have the supports that we need. Excellently stated, and then and a good time to sign off. Thanks so much to Absolutely. both of you for coming in, and we're going to have to have you back in the future to, to get more into that. What didn't we talk about? Absolutely. Sounds great. We'd appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Great.
Before we go to our timeout segment, where we share a bit of comedy, which we sure could use right now to balance things out, we want to talk to someone who certainly knows about recovery. By the way, she also knows her way around comedy, Tracy Newman. Tracy was a TV writer producer for 16 years. She started as a staff writer on Cheers, and in 1997, she won an Emmy and a Peabody Award for co-writing the groundbreaking Coming Out episode of Ellen. She also was a co-executive producer of that show. In 2001, she co-created the ABC comedy According to Jim. Playing guitar since she was 14, she is now a full-time singer-songwriter. Not long ago, she started Run Along Home, a company that focuses on age-appropriate lyrics for very young children. Tracy also has several CDs for grown-ups, too, and performs concerts all over the Southland. Today, Tracy has not only agreed to talk to us about her own addiction treatment experience, but she's also agreed to share one of her comedic songs. In fact, she's going to perform it right here on the Hourglass during our Time Out segment. But first, <laughs> thanks, Tracy, for being on the show with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. This now, is a pretty cool setup. Yeah, not too bad, <laughs> not right? Not too bad. So... Uh, I understand that you were at one point in addiction treatment, uh, which at that point was called rehab. Yes, it was still called rehab, and I don't know if I can ever change. Okay. <laughs> but what, what, was, what was your story? How did you end up uh, in an inpatient treatment center for Well, for it was opioids, addiction? first of all, which, uh -huh. which I went to Passages, which is more alcohol than anything else. And so mm -hmm. I was kind of the loner there. Right. But uh, I, was, I had a... Lower back, you know, like a slip disc kind of thing, which is a pretty popular reason to put people on opioids at the time. And uh, this was about 10 years ago. And um, I started taking them then, and then I'd go off of them, and then I'd go back on. And, you know, there's never been a way to get people off of those, right. really. You just do it yourself. But if you end up being on them for a long time, you can't get off. Because right. the the symptoms of getting off of opioids, you know, you're annoyed, you get a runny nose, your eyes are running, yeah. you're you're uh, sneezing all the time, you're uh, I don't know, it's it's and you're agitated all the time. It's too many things, and where you know, oh, if I just take a little bit of Vicodin, sure, you know, uh, I don't mm -hmm. go through all that, yeah. especially if you have a, a gig or you have you know, so. so uh, for a long time, I was just taking a little bit, kind of as needed. Yeah. Um, and I could still get them prescribed. But then about 2017 or so, I couldn't get them anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I actually started with, I had a boyfriend who had a dealer. <laughs> this is way too much information. <laughs> uh, anyway, he had a dealer and I, I so I was buying, I was actually buying and I was seeing how much money I was spending on this. Sure. And I did it for four years, and I was only up to, you know, I mean, people who know this drug, 40 milligrams a day is what I took. Mm -hmm. That's not that much. Right. But if you're going to do it every day, you need a supply. Yeah. So not only was it starting to get expensive for me, and, uh, it, it, and because they would increase the value, you know, mm -hmm. it got to be real exp especially when it started to be impossible to get it. Sure. You know, so... Uh, then what I noticed was, um, I'm going to be very graphic, but you know, constipation mm -hmm. is a problem for everybody anyway with a lot of things, but especially with opioids. Right. And so what it can do, though, if you're taking it regularly, is it can sort of stop the peristalsis in your... So mm -hmm. I suddenly stopped going to the bathroom. Right. And I thought, oh, well, this will, you know, so... If, Five days, 10 days, wow. 14 days. Finally, I told my daughter. Mm -hmm. And she f didn't know about any of this, and she freaked out. And she's the one that, you know, she brought got a doctor to put, put you know, to, to give me the stuff you take when you're going to have a colonoscopy, right. which didn't work right away. So we thought maybe there's a block. I mean, it got scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she said, do you want to go to rehab? And uh, she said she found this place in Malibu. It's very expensive. Sure. I'm not going to say how much because I'm embarrassed. Of all the things I'm embarrassed about, that's what I'm that's embarrassed <laughs> about the most. <laughs> and I went for 30 days. And uh, really, they, they cleaned me out in two days. I mean, I was off that drug in two days. I was so scared right. to ever take it again. But the first two days, I don't even remember. I mean, mm -hmm. they give you so much stuff, not only to go to the bathroom, but... Right. They, they know how to get you off the beginnings of, 
of withdrawal. Right. And then I just went through, I didn't take Suboxone or anything. I just went through 30 days of kind of finding out when I would feel like really taking it, Mm -hmm. you know, and when I was fine without it and doing, you know, physical exercise and acu... I mean, the, the passages... It gets it. People laugh about that place because it's been on sure. the TV shows and stuff. But it's the the staff is amazing. Mm-hmm. The food. I mm-hmm. imagine you've heard about the food. Yeah, Maybe yeah. you've even tasted it if you've visited anybody right. there. It's the best food probably in town, right. other than Jones on Third. <laughs> and uh, no, it's it's a remarkable remarkable chefs. And so I was kind of enjoying it after a while. I was enjoying mm-hmm. the, the setting. Yeah. And uh, the people there, some of them have been, this is their 10th, 12th time. Sure. And once you know how much passages cost. Yeah, you add it up real quick in your head. You can't believe it. Yeah. You just can't believe it. And so uh, I met some people that I stuck with. After I left, I stayed friends with them sort of mm-hmm. through texting, and then that kind of drifted away. Yeah. It's like going through war. Right. Together, you know, you, 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 a lot of times you don't end up with those people in the long run. Right. So that that's kind of my story, and now it hasn't been. It's been a year. It hasn't been hard for me, except for certain times mm-hmm. of the day. I'll find myself thinking, "Oh, this is one of the reasons I was taking it regularly." Mm-hmm. You know, and the pain. By the way, I had I had a back operation. Didn't need it anymore. Right. I just couldn't get off it. Yeah, yeah. So wow. So I mean, it, you've talked about so many things that come up. In addiction, the, yeah. the avoiding the withdrawal symptoms is one of the key ingredients to, to getting addicted to anything. Yeah, just the daily things that would happen when you when, even when you went too long without without a pill. Yeah, and it's just it's just you just say to yourself, well, this will all go away if yeah. I just take a pill. And you talked about the dependence too that yeah. you have to start taking more. And then yeah, the but I didn't. Thing. I didn't take more. I mean that that's the thing is I. Uh-huh. I I really, I hate to say this, but I kind of only quit because of what it was, what I found out it was really doing to my intestines. Right, right. I don't know if I would have quit, other than the fact that I was getting it illegally and... and paying a lot of money. paying a lot of money. I, I probably would have quit. Right. And it was a drag dealing with the dealer and stuff. I sure. Hated, I hated all of that. Right. I hated it. Yeah. And was embarrassed. Mm-hmm. You know. And then you also hit upon the idea that when you go into a residential treatment center, the first thing they do is detox you. That was those first two days yeah. where you don't remember anything. Yeah. They're just getting it out of your system. Yes. And then they try and teach you new ways of behaving. Right. And then you're, you're having to deal with why you really took it because it's sure. not just the pain, obviously. Right, right. You know. And, you know, they, they say in, at passages there it's based on addi- the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm-hmm. And I had found myself pulling away from, not my family, but from hanging out with friends and, mm-hmm. and even doing gigs, you know, singing gigs. I was just doing it, of course, over this last, you know, COVID yeah. hit in, two, yeah. in 2020, and I was already isolated. Mm-hmm. So when I went into rehab, you know, at the end of last year, uh, it was still an isolation period. So... Mm-hmm. It was interesting to me that at passage, passages, they, they didn't require masks. Right. Anybody coming in had to wear a mask. Right. But uh, nobody got sick either uh-huh. that I know of. Right. And all of the people that were there. Yeah. So interesting. Really interesting, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, we won't even get into the COVID no. and the wearing masks <laughs> and people who got it. We'll stay away from yeah. that. So those first few days uh, when you went to Passages, Mm -hmm. uh, what went on and how was it for you getting used to being in a a group setting? Well, when you first go to Passages, the first thing, what they do is they put you, they put you in a room next door to one of the nurses stations. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, you know, there's a, they, you're not, you can't lock your doors there. They can walk in any time. Yeah. Which causes a lot of trouble mm-hmm. later on for some of the yeah. women, actually. Yeah, they get yeah. very angry about it. Uh, but when you're first there, it's a good thing because I was, I don't remember, I, I know they gave me a lot of pills, mm-hmm. you know, stuff to clean my system out and also 
related to uh, addiction. You know, I mean, I'm, addiction seems to me at this point to be the least of it. In sure. with opioids, it was clear mm-hmm. my intestines. Right. I'm telling you, I don't know what they did right. because right. I don't remember anything. Mm-hmm. I don't remember getting out of bed to go to the bathroom. Yeah. But I must have. Right. You know, I don't. I don't know. I mean, they. Yeah, they put they put you out. Right. So that you don't have to live through the the very beginning of withdrawal. Sure, that makes sense. And and uh, the, you know, because I was only taking four pills a day. Right. <laughs> you know, so only. Yeah. I don't think it was such a big physical addiction that they had to deal with it. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, when I after the second day of it or the third day of it. My eyes were watering, my nose was running, my mouth was dry, I was, you know, I, I mean, there were so many physical things that I would love to have taken a pill to get rid of. Sure. And they give you, um, it starts with an A, it's not Ambien, Adabil. Adabil? Adavan. Uh, Adavan. Yeah. Is that right? Anti-anxiety medication? Yeah, they yeah. give you that and... In fact, that's their, their barometer. If you're somebody that's not on Suboxone or any of those things, or methadone, I guess, yeah. you, uh, you take usually about four of those a day, or four at one time even. Mm-hmm. And then uh, once they start weaning you off of that, you know, there are stages or, or levels of being in yeah. rehab. Yeah. You, like there's the people that can't go out of the place. Right. They don't let you out. But you can go out if you're not taking that anymore. Right. So uh, I quickly got off of everything, you know. Right. And still never left the place. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see a reason to leave, actually. Right, right. Uh, certainly not for food. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so where, where can people find you? Uh, where well, are you performing um, next? I, I just did some shows with uh, a group of uh, other songwriters. So I'm only doing maybe four or five songs in the mm-hmm. shows. But uh, it's kind of all I feel like doing right now yeah and the other we all have fan bases myself and each person in the group so we're going to be at mccabe's on um which is in santa monica mccabe's guitar Mm -hmm. shop uh yeah on february 26th which is a sunday night Mm -hmm. so that's i think that's my next thing great you know all right and so can we convince you to do a song here with us today oh my goodness yes (laughs) (laughs) all right let's get you set up okay all right then, our Time Out comedy segment today will feature Tracy Newman. What are you going to sing to us? Well, I'm going to sing, I don't want to tell you the name of it because that will kind of ruin it. Okay. Okay, but it's uh, apropos of what we've been talking about, I guess. I wish I could see you and tell you I love you, hold you and squeeze you and crush you with hugs. But when I'm with you, I want all your drugs, which are fine when I'm on them. It's fun to be high, but when I come down, I just want to die. I feel wasted and worthless and lazy and tired. I can't do my work even when I'm inspired. I can't sleep cause I'm anxious and wired For that you've got downers if I don't want to feel But dehydration is part of that deal And I tend to gain weight cause I eat when I'm low When none of my clothes fit you bring out the blow But if I'm too thin you don't want me no more so if you've been wondering where i've been i'm putting an end to this cycle i'm in far be it from me to suggest that you quit but i can't be around you can't be around you with all of your sh- And I no longer know if it's you that I love Or the thrill of your chemicals I'm dreaming of 
I just can't be with you cause I'm kicking drugs, you can do it too. No, I can't be with you cause I'm kicking drugs. Now one more thing. Now here is an encore you didn't ask for. Your mind and your body are the wrong things to waste. But if you insist, then before it's too late, don't hesitate. Put it in writing, do not resuscitate. Amazing. <laughs> Loved it. Nice to know we can poke a little fun on a show like today's. Yeah. And, uh, and we definitely need some comedic relief from time to time. Yeah. Uh, as tough as things are, uh, if we stand back for a moment and laugh, it really helps. Uh, where can viewers find that song if they want to share it with someone? I'm afraid that song is not recorded yet, but it is on YouTube. I think you can look up, if you look up Tracy Newman uh, at McCabe's or just Lots of mm -hmm. Drugs. It's called Lots of Drugs. All right. Great. And where can they find uh, out more about your CDs and Run Along Home? Um, all of my CDs are on, you know, if you just ask Alexa and Siri, mm -hmm. uh, they're on all of the platforms, Spotify, and I don't even know what the platforms are anymore. Apple? Right. Right. And uh, if you want the adult stuff, the grown-up stuff, it's uh, Tracy Newman and the reinforcements. I'm sorry to lay that on you but if you just say tracy newman you're going to get children's songs <laughs> thanks so much for coming in thank you it's been a pleasure for now on a more serious note pardon the pun i'd like to close out this episode with lyrics like i always do with another song suggestion that keeps you conscious of time it's an old song by simon and garfunkel a hazy shade of winter it's a song about life one reviewer said in explaining the intent behind it quote whether it's the end of your 20s the collapse of a long-term relationship, or you've made the choice to leave one job for another. It's a song about reflecting on your life up to a point. As we get near to closing out the year, it's a good time to look at where you are and where you want to go. If you're not happy with what you see, don't despair. Don't get stuck. Instead, simply reflect. Now as the song goes, time, time, time. See what's become of me. No pressure though, just assess. There's another key lyric that follows that thought. Seasons change with the scenery. Weave in time in a tapestry. The overriding message then is that your life is a unique tapestry. Metaphorically, every mile you travel is one more interesting adventure along life's journey. Think of the new year as yet another destination with the opportunity to add a new piece to your colorful tapestry, which by the way, is unlike anyone else's. And don't forget, Give yourself two positives for every negative.